Well, hi, everybody. Glenn the Geek here, and I'm here with my friend, host of the Horsemanship Radio Show, Debbie. We're just going to kill a minute or two while people get on here live. We're the warm-up group, uh, huh? Yeah, that's it. We're the warm-up band. That's the what we are. <laughs> everybody loves the warm-up band, Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> you will make it someday, Glenn. Well, well you know what? They love the warm-up band if the warm-up band is really short, like right. really short, and you exactly. get to the main act, which we're going to do. But right. We're just waiting for some live people, and they're starting to connect in there now. Right. If you're joining us live, please put your name in the comments below and write where you're from. We want to know where you're from. Right. And uh, we're going to get to Monty here shortly, answering a whole bunch of listener questions about horse training and horses. We have uh, another special guest coming up as well. Uh, we have some people joining us live. If you're joining us from the auditor room, uh, we have something special for you tonight, too. Thank so you. we have Stephanie from Minnesota. We have Mackenzie joining us from Chattanooga. I love Chattanooga. We spent some time there. It's nice. We have California. Oh, Nellie's here. So your your friends yeah. are being represented in okay, Australia. Yeah. Back in the audience, whenever I can. <laughs> <laughs> Ariel from Indiana. Hi, Ariel. Dr. Ellen's here. Hey, Dr. Ellen. Good to see you. Nellie says we both look and sound great. You look better than me, but. Uh... Mm, thank you. I'm and working we have, on that. Uh, Kim in California. Good to see you all tonight. Okay. Auditors. Uh, auditors, if you're watching this, please watch in the auditor room because we have something special. Uh, you guys get to win something tonight. So if you're watching from the auditor room, that'll happen. Uh, uh, California. Michelle in Alberta. Hey, Canada. Hey, we got Canada yeah, we're good there. to see you guys. So while we're waiting for everybody to get in, we're, we're up to 50 already. So let's talk a little bit about the movement. It's, it's being scrolled across the bottom there. Uh, and then we're going to get Jamie and Monty on here to answer some questions. So tell everybody really quickly, Reader's Digest, what the movement is. The movement is an event that we started about five years ago. In fact, Nellie's on this call, my partner in crime. Um, we wanted to uh, pass a message on to the United States. We, Dad had been traveling for so many years, about 30 overseas, and it was time to do something back home. And there were a lot of great messages that were skin deep going on out there, nonviolence on horses. Yeah, that's good. Check that box, you know, uh, better educational tools. Check that box. We've been doing that, but we had really put a messaging together of really how that relationship is built between horse and human and how that would be transferred from dad to um, us, us horse girls who um, loved horses and Maybe it's that time of life where you can get into horses and you can afford a horse and you can get back some of that thrill that you had as a kid too and get into horses. So we started off with some amazing presenters and we had so much fun that we started to innovate. So the second year and the third year, of course, we did hit a COVID year, but that was pretty cool because we did live streaming. So the message is that horses do more for the inside of us than they do for the outside of us. And I think every horse girl knows what I'm talking about when I say that. And so what does that look like? Well, it looks like different things for different people. And we bring in presenters like Jamie Jennings, who is so good at transcribing what dad's teaching us into horse girl talk. And she tells you every day on horses in the morning, what that looks like. And she's going to do some Q and A's today, which I'm really excited about. But this year, the movement is June 17, 18, 19. But we're and doing that's a that flag is up farm in California. It is right yep. in central California, the Santa Barbara County wine and horses. And um, I think probably the innovation that is the most interesting this year is we kept getting feedback from people. They loved watching the gentling. They loved watching the join ups. They love the presenters that we've had here. Some amazing people. Uh, Temple Grandin, you know, I mean, some amazing people that people know. And and the 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 feedback we were getting is, but I would love to work with horses a little bit when we're out there, too. You know, we need a little hands on time with horses. So the innovation is that on the third day, people can stay and stay for a private session. So there's private sessions with our and we'll talk about the hosts that are going to come out here and be there. It's really an HRN roundup, isn't it? Yeah. So we have a bunch of uh, Horse Radio Network hosts coming out. Jennifer and I will be out there. Uh, Jamie, of course, will be out there. She'll be presenting during the weekend. 
Uh, we have Helena, who is my original co-host 13 years ago. She was the she was the first host here on the Horse Radio Network, her and I. Um, and then we also have uh, Templeton Thompson coming, doing a concert one night. So our good friend Templeton Thompson, uh, Dr. Wendy Ying, who is w- one of my early co-hosts as well, is also a veterinarian and traditional Chinese medicine doctor. So we have a whole bunch of things going on. There's a link up there where you can sign up. There's only like 15 tickets left. So you, you're definitely going to want to sign up early, come out, join us, have some fun. We'll have a good time. We have a concert planned. We have uh, cocktails planned. Uh, uh, I will buy the Able Skeevers and make sure that everybody's well supplied. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, it is the Danish capital of America. So we have right. people on here. If they see Solvang, they'll go to the wine, they'll go to the food. But I hope they stay for the horses. And that third day, everybody will have an opportunity if it isn't sold out, have an opportunity to sign up for a private session and pay for that private session. And you get to work with horses. So you finally get your dream. Maybe somebody wanted to do a join up with Jamie. We've got one session left with Jamie. Thank you, Nellie. Um, one session left, um, I think one or two, maybe with Mark Bolander on the trail. So anybody tonight, this is a huge opportunity for HRN auditors or anybody else logging in right now. Uh, to buy a ticket to the movement and still have an opportunity. Monty has sold out, but we kind of figured that might happen. Yeah, that probably happened pretty quickly. <laughs> happened <Yeah>. pretty quick. <laughs> um, but it is, it's such a cool thing to be able to live through the, the two days of the Friday and Saturday. Of course, Friday night's the concert with Tempe and Sam Gay. And that's going to be so fun. We've never had a concert before. We've had a lot of wine and we had a lot of <laughs> charcuterie out in the park. It's so pretty here. In now Chinese. we can have wine and song all at the we same can. time. <laughs> yes. Hopefully we won't join in, right, Glenn? No, not the song part. <laughs> so before we bring, I'm going to bring Jamie on here just uh, in, a, in one minute. We wanted to say auditors watching in the auditor Facebook room right now, if you think you want to come out we we are going to give away one ticket that's right one free ticket now you still have to provide your transportation and lodging but we are going to provide the ticket for you to come out and spend the weekend with us all you have to do is put in the comments below in the auditor room that you're interested and then we're just going to pick a winner we're going to put a names in a hat uh for everybody interested in the end of the night when uh jamie and monty have uh run out of talking we will pick a winner so Post below in the auditor room, and we will pick a winner from that. But I think we should bring them on now. What do you think? Well, yeah, I just want people to know where to go for the website, yep. too, which is MontyRoberts.com. It's oh, it's up there for you. Okay. It's right up you. there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot you said that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, go to MontyRoberts.com. Do you want me to move the big man into the seat? Yes. Let's do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce Jamie first. I'm going to take you away, and we'll come back later. Okay, Debbie? We'll see you later. So my co-host of uh, almost 12 years now on the longest running independent daily podcast in the world, Jamie Jennings, also a certified Monty Roberts instructor, that other thing too. Hey everybody, you're getting so good at this technology, it's impressive. I know, oh I've done it a little. (laughs) (laughs) We've done it a little now. We got real good at it during COVID. Uh, So so Jamie, uh, when, how long have you had your certified instructor I started training for it in 2015, and at the age of 40, I received my certification in 2018. So I've been doing it ever since. Now, it is definitely the full time. This is this is the fun part, you know. Then then the to go out and train the horses. That's the rest of the full workday for me, and I've definitely been busy. If anybody is interested in getting certified, please do because I would like to. I'm booked through September, Glenn, for training. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, so it's just a lot of people are figuring out that you can be nonviolent and you get a lot more done with your horse. Uh, so. I encourage anybody to start taking courses. You can do all that at flag is up. Just go to montyroberts.com. Um, but yeah, it's been quite, quite the journey. Well, I'm going to bail out of here and you can introduce your friend who's going to help you out tonight. So what's happening tonight is we got questions from listeners. Yes, of ours. I apologize. Like I got so many questions and 
I, I think Mondi and I could sit here and talk till two in the morning. Well, I probably. will cut you off before this. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. But so I wasn't able to get to all of them, but I gave them all to him and he went through them and picked the ones they thought would be like the most radio friendly. If you are still frantically in search of an answer, message me after this and we'll get together and, and figure out a way to, to help you with your problem. Or we'll answer it on our show on Horses in the Morning. One yeah, the you know. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> all right. I'm bailing out. Okay, well, I would like to, Horse and Hound named him one of the 50 greatest horsemen of all time. He is my hero, my mentor, my coach, and he's also the guy that I call when I can't figure something out <laughs> with a horse that's been sent to me. Um, he is the trainer for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and um, I'm pleased to be able to hang out with you virtually. Monty, thank you for joining us. Uh it's hard for me to thank you enough for having me on. You know, at this late stage in my life, um, you wouldn't think these things would happen. But in the last two or three days, I've heard about this coming up and that I'm going to do it. And I heard the questions that came through and stuff. And my mind has just been on those questions. And I've just been dying to talk to the people and to realize a lot of things that haven't been said. And things I haven't, um, you know, made terribly important in, in talking to people. And I'm going to do that today as much as I can. I'm going to bring you things from the spaces of my mind that have become there because of 87 years of looking at horses and knowing horses. My first, um, my first competition was uh, about 82 years ago, 83 years ago. So, wow. yeah. Um, so it's a lot of fun. So come on at me. Well, I was going to talk to you first. What's a, a lot of fun for me as a certified instructor is, is to be so blessed to have this farm and be able to work with people's horses. And it's, it's just, you know, you have people that train thoroughbreds, you have people that train quarter horses, you have people that train draft horses. And in the past year, I have been sent ponies, quarter horses, I made a list, thoroughbreds, X race horses, unstarted and unraced. I have a Tennessee walking horse here right now. I have a Clydesdale. I just sent home a gypsy Vanner. I've had yearlings. I've started 14, uh, one up to 14 years old, all of these different breeds and types. And it's not just a specialty. It's just a concept of using the horse's language to help the horse using the horse. It's just, it's a horse. It's, it doesn't matter what the breed is sometimes. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Four legs, long neck. It's a horse. <laughs> That's their behavioral pattern. Um, horses are 50 million years old, but through that time, they've branched off into different sizes and different uses, but they're still a horse and they will respond to those core stimulations in exactly the same way as they did 50 million years ago. Right. Now, uh, of all those breeds that I mentioned, I know you've worked with more. Oh, I forgot to mention the Arabian. Uh, of all those breeds, what are some of the ones that are the most interesting to you? And what are some of the ones that maybe you didn't like so much? I know that's you like them all, but uh, wow. what are some of the I, favorites? I wouldn't like to answer that any more than to answer what kind of people I like more than <laughs> other people. What nationality I like more than other people. I find something to like about every single horse on the face of this earth. And yes, I have been far more involved with quarter horses in the Western division. That's how I started. And I won um, yeah, several world championships in rodeo, and but mostly working cow horses. And the working cow horse division has changed incredibly since my first book came out. I, I could go into why and, and the circumstances of it, but let's just say that I am so pleased that it's made the changes, like way ahead of me. They're just rolling on and getting better and better and better. Wow. Well, we had some some listeners and, and 
Facebook fans, send me a bunch of questions ahead. So I've picked out some of the, we have picked out some of the questions. And uh, I guess we'll start with Hillary. And her question is, and this is interesting, and you said this would be really good. So I'm excited about your answer. She says, why would a healthy, happy, social, well-trained gelding hide his face in the corner when it's time to put the bridle on? Uh, What is he telling me? Yeah, and and um, let me say before we start answering these questions that in general, I don't think I've ever said this before. In general, when you have a question come up about the behavior of a horse, learn to smile and let the horse do it, but have consequences for doing it. And that's the way I developed the Dooley halter. It causes consequences for what you would consider to be bad behavior. And there should be just as many consequences for good behavior as there is for bad behavior. Now let's take up hiding his head in the corner. Oh, it's okay when you go in with a halter, but when you go in with the bit and bridle, he says, no, just stop and think about it for a minute. He knows what comes after the bit and bridle. And he knows what comes after the halter. And he knows what comes after the bucket of grain and the flake of hay. And he will respond to those things almost 100% of the time in the same way each time. So if you're going in there with a bit and bridle and he's saying no and hiding his head in the corner, he's not happy with what happens after you put the bit and bridle on. And I promise you that that horse has not been uh, addressed with honey on the bit. Oh, you don't want to use food now to train horses. I'm not using food. I just put a little honey on the bit. It's not from the human hand. And if you do that, I, I guarantee it. You will, within one week, if you do it properly, you'll be able to stand at the door, roll it open or swing it open, whichever way it works, and hold the bit there and he will come over and put it on himself. And you can, yeah, and they can see that whole lesson, I believe, and read about it too. You've written a lot about it in your books and also on MontyRobertsUniversity.com. I have, I have. And uh, Bob Mitchum, Robert Mitchum, actor, got very upset when he lost a bet to me about a horse that they'd been trying to put the bid on for a couple of years, a couple of years. And I said, by next Saturday, that's one week, by next Saturday, if the horse will come off the wall and put the bid on himself, I just hold it up and he puts it on, then you pay me double the training fee. And if he doesn't come and put it on himself, I have to train the horse for free for two months. Well, he grabbed into that on the minute because Bob Mitchum was close with his dollar. But boy, oh boy, did it cost me in Cuddy Sark Scotch whiskey when I when I won the bet. And he came to my cowboy saloon and we had a good time. But it's <laughs> worth talking about uh, because just remember, uh, Love your horse and everything they do because it's even if it's bad behavior, it's an attempt or it's a potential to get them right and like you better because you're going to figure out a way to cause them to want to change. Exactly. Next question. Lisa says, what can I do to make my horse more comfortable and patient with the farrier? The horse has no patience, apparently. He'll hold up his foot for only a minute, but then he's going to slam it back down again. Interesting question, because right now I have two horses that are half brothers, Chrome and Buns, Steel, steel Buns. Steel Buns, I love yeah, them. Yeah, and, and nice Chrome. And they're, they're half, they're full brothers. They're full brothers. And uh, one is 18 and the other one's 16. And both of them have suddenly said, I don't want the farrier around. Oh, so they call me and say, both of these horses don't want the farrier around. What farrier is it? You know, and you wonder what the farrier did. But in, in, 
I'm telling you within less than a day of treatment, in less than an hour of treatment, they stood like completely 100% accepting of, of shoeing, the dually halter. And every time they wanted to make a funny move, I'd ask the farrier to put the foot down and step back away from them. And I'd ask them to back up 15, 20 feet, 30 feet, back up off that dually halter and then come forward off the dually halter, firmly come forward. Now I'll let the rope swing again. I let the lead rope swing again. I say, pick his foot up again. And now what I get is, could you please come and put the dually halter on the horse and just have somebody stand there? Because when the dually halter on, they both stand perfectly still. But some little thing was done by this farrier to cause them to go that way. Dually halter back up and cause them, you, you smile. You say, go ahead and do that because I get to back you up about 20 feet and then bring you forward firmly and then swing the thing and sit down in a chair and watch the horse cooperate with the farrier. It'll work. I was, I was trying to load a horse this morning and, uh, the, the, well, it was adopted and they came and they put the dually on and they went to load it and the horse started running backwards and they were like, no, no, no. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is, we want this to happen. I take, took the line and I said, oh, I'm so glad you backed up. I really wanted you to back up, but I wanted you to back up like a way farther. And so we're going to back up 30 feet and then we're going to come back to the trailer. And then that's where the good stuff happens. I don't want to go to back up. Oh, great. I was so hoping you were going to back up because now yeah, we most, get to back up most, more. Most bad behavior is not wanted by that animal. They just do it because they get away with it and they get you to raise up your adrenaline. And they, they own you. Right. So smile. Just and relax, it, smile, and use the dually halter. And I promise you, they will change. And we'll, mentioning the dually halter, we had a few questions coming from, let's say, Jacqueline, Allison, Alicia, and Melanie. And they all had questions that were related to that. Like, let's see, my horse doesn't get hand fed, but gets nippy when grooming. Or... Um, let's see how to train a horse to remain calm when tied up, even if they spook a little bit. Um, how do you stop a horse who's been allowed to scratch and rub his face on people? I feel like these are questions that you might use that answer. Smile, relax, and back the horse up on the dually halter firmly, bring him forward and continue to groom. And he'll stop the nipping because it costs him to nip. You can't, and you don't want to swat him in the nose. And then he owns you. He's got you then. The next thing he could do is slap you with the front foot. And these, these other things that you mentioned, they all fall in the same category of uh, little bad behavior here and there. Dually halter, back up, come forward, relax, leave the rope down and say, want to do that again? Yay. It's so fun to back up. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I heard you say one time, um, that if you have a horse that bites and you hit it in the face, you're just teaching him to bite faster. Absolutely bite faster and harder. And as he bites down, he rears back cause he, he knows the hit is coming. And that really hurts when the horse pulls back with his teeth closed on your skin. Believe me. Yeah, and and there was one about leg yielding. That's next. That's I'll give next. you that one. Yes, I know you're excited about this one. Okay, so how? Let's see here. So this is not very fancy. I've got this is like my my list is just a big chicken scratch mess. Um, <clears throat> so they want to know how to get a horse to leg yield the easiest way and the most effective way to cause a horse to yield from your right. leg without <laughs> using any violence how can i get my horse to leg yield better exactly well we're That's not going to tell. use we're not going to use violence for any of these answers at all even the dually halter you just back them up firmly you don't use any violence like kicking hitting swatting uh, any of that stuff but leg yielding can you believe, I mean, I, I have two doctorates in behavioral sciences. I went to four universities. I have a normal IQ. I am no genius by any stretch of the imagination. And yet we've been training horses for 6,000 years. 
without realizing that they are positive thigmotaxic and that they move into pressure instead of away from pressure. Yes, a lot of people know that. The dressage people know it for sure. And they ride a horse for two years before they ask them to change leads because the horse won't move off their leg. And all of a sudden, the queen has one that's ultra dangerous, moving into pressure really bad, knocking things apart, hitting plastic things, I don't know, everything. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, I woke up thinking about the top pole, training off pressure pole. We have uh, lessons on the online university about that to get into it a little further. But it's simply teaching the horse to move off pressure on the sides. And in three or four days, that filly had stopped breaking things and bashing into things and kicking people, just completely stopped it. And uh, now I can cause horses to do flying lead changes in two weeks instead of two years. Now and easily do it because they will move off your leg instead of moving off the leg in front and 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 changing in so that they disunite and have the wrong lead behind. Um, so uh, the top pole training off pressure pole. Uh, now. It's all I, I would like to ask too, maybe if you could talk about why horses move into pressure as opposed to away from pressure naturally. Yeah. Anytime that you think about something that works like this, you think, why did mother nature ever have the horse go into pain instead of away from pain? Well, we go into pain in our mouth. And you know that the child with red gums and really a lot of pain in their mouth will want to bite down on a hard rubber ring because we, we are thigmotaxic in our mouth. That's the only place for us humans, okay? However, the horse is thigmotaxic, particularly in the flanks and behind the rib cage, because that's where the dogs rip the skin. And the horse that just flew away had the skin rip easy and became food for the dogs. Well, the dogs had to live too. But the horse that went into the dog and kicked him in the head, got him to open his mouth, and then they ran away, and they made it. So first you go into pressure. And when it's relieved, released, then you can run away. So that's thigmotaxic um, action. And horses are some of the best at it, except for wild deer, which are more uses of thigmotaxis than any animal on the face of the earth and 10 times more flighty. So they will go into pressure an instant, just an instant to get you to get off of it. And then they'll run away. And in fact, the deer are aerial thigmotaxic. If you try to drive them north, they'll go south. If you try to drive them south, they will go north. And the professional hunters have learned this because they wrap around the hunter and they will set their guns so that they can kill them when they go back around to go the other way. Ah, it's a funny way to put it, but in fact, horses are thigmotaxic, and we can study that, and we can see it, and um, you can teach them to move off your leg. In three to five, maybe the worst of them, seven days, they're moving off the leg. Just so you know, last time I was visiting, my husband spent a lot of time learning mm -hmm. uh, the construction of the top pole, because I do not have one, because I used a kitchen sponge and that's not very effective <laughs> mop. Uh, so he actually constructed me one for our anniversary. <laughs> so oh, my, my anniversary gift last year was some concrete for the washer rack. This year was a top pole. You know, it's practicality. You guys are a romantic girls. couple. You really I know, are. Yes. So sweet. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I, I wanted to jump in here because I'm excited to say that Mary just said she signed up for the movement. She Yay, just signed Mary! up. So good job, Mary. And we do have more spots left, not a lot, but we have more spots left for the movement in June. Uh, Monty, do you have you have to have loved doing the movement now? It, it has to be a fun weekend for you, too. Oh, it is for sure. And when Debbie first came up with this, I, I didn't know what the heck to think about it, you know. But bringing those people in and uh, Temple Grandin, for instance, coming in and and then... We did the thing where the horse comes to the mounting block, you know, 
And it, the whole thing was over. That was the year that we had to do it on uh, whatever you call that. On thing. video, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with computers. And the queen calls to say, that was wonderful. Do more of it. Show more about that horse coming to the to the mounting block. And please, would you teach my trainer how to get my horse to come to the mounting block? <laughs> because she was using the mounting block a lot. Wow, that was so encouraging to me that uh, a lady of her importance and uh, a world leader would have been tuned in to our little movement thing, which isn't any longer a little thing. It's, it's uh, yeah, a, a, a huge part of this life of mine in my 80s, yeah. And I well, was the it, dummy rider on the mounting block for that whole session, and then oh, I get a phone yeah. call, and oh, I was like... <gasps> Um, Jamie, so, you know, when you and Monty did the mounting block lesson, yeah, the queen of England really appreciated that. I was like, what? <laughs> I would have dressed better if I had known. Right? Yeah. Use some makeup. <laughs> My hair did. <laughs> yeah. So sign up for the movement. You can do it. It's right up. There's the link. It's moneyroberts.com. Just click the movement at the top of the page. There's still some spots left. Come out and join us. There's like five hosts from the Horse Radio Network going. It's going to be a lot of fun. They're going to do the serious stuff during the day, and then we're doing the partying at night. So uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll help be in charge of the partying at night. I'll let you guys do the serious stuff. But we do have spots left. There's one spot left for Jamie on Sunday. And you, yes, you can use Monty's horses. You don't have to bring your own. So for the private lessons on Sunday, there's one spot left with Jamie. And apparently there's a waiting list for Monty. I don't know why. Um, but apparently there is. So uh, you can get on that waiting list too, I think. Question uh, but, for Debbie uh, yeah. that was asked. It, can people audit those private lessons or is it strictly yeah. private? Yes, they can. She's okay. answering that yes, they yeah, can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can watch all you want on Sunday, and that's free. That's part of not free, but it's part of the ticket that you're getting for the rest of the weekend. Yeah. So it's a fun area. It's a fun place to be. There's hotels right down the street. They're they're uh, they're affordable, so it's definitely a good time. And we want you to sign up today. Now, auditors, if you just joined, if you want a chance to win a free ticket, and you know you can get out there, you can you can do your own transportation and hotel. Uh, we're giving away one free ticket tonight to auditors, and I have about eight or nine people that have already uh, signed up or posted below. Just post below that you're interested, and we'll put a name in a hat, put all the names in a hat, and pick a winner at the end of the night. Perfect. Um, somebody just asked right now who came in at the end, what is the top poll? You can go to MontyRobertsUniversity.com. You can have a free day pass and watch I mean, hundreds, seven, eight, 800 videos of Monty training horses. And uh, they're great. They've got Q&As at the end, really an educational thing. But you can see the top poll there. It's just a really cool. It's it, This is what happens. And I'm turning into you uh, in a certain way, Monty, because so many times we'd be in the classroom the next morning and Monty would come down. Well, guys, I didn't sleep last night. I what thought is. about that horse. And this is what we're going to do today. Oh yeah. my gosh, it's happening to me. Like I'll come down and be like, okay, because I have an assistant. I'm like, this is what we're going to do today. And he's like, where'd you come up with that? I'm like, I didn't sleep last night. No, I was there. We're just thinking about this horse and what you could do. Well, welcome to the event that we <laughs> have created here. But um, it, it shows that we have fun with it. And, uh, you know, my last piece of advice is smile, let them do it but they pay a consequence for it. No violence, no pain. You don't hurt them for it, but they're uncomfortable for it. There's ways yeah. to do it. And I just keep showing different ways. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let you ask more questions. I know you have more. I'm going to bail out, but uh, sign up today. Okay. Bye. Get out. Go away. <laughs> All right. The next question is interesting because we haven't ever talked about this. Um, and it's from Jennifer. And she said, I ride the limited distance endurance ride. And in the first loop, we fight to keep a pace. The second 15 miles, she's perfect. The first 15, we argue the whole way. What is the best way to get her to settle down? Isn't that something that um, for, yeah, 40 years of my life, I lived in the thoroughbred racing industry. And that's the same story in that business. If you have a speed horse that stops in the last quarter of a mile or gets tired in the last quarter of a mile, you don't have a winner. So they have to pace themselves and live within their own abilities. And you have to get them to pace themselves. One of the things that I've done, and I was working on one today, 
that needed the draw reins just so that I could teach him to come with his chin a bit closer to his chest and relax a little more and then have the rider give some more slack to the reins and he stays a little more relaxed than that business of the nose stuck out and going against a hard pull. And oftentimes in the um, endurance world, they go against a hard pull. And so look at your bit. They, they want to have a softer bit than, than the hard bit, but they want to have leverage on it so that you can hold that head down closer to their chest and get them to learn to relax in that early stages when they have plenty of injury, so that energy. plenty of energy, so that they will pick it up slightly for the second part. And if you're dividing it into threes, and then really sprint that last part. Um, it's no different, really, when you stop and think about it. Uh, endurance should be divided into three separate stages of use of energy. And horse racing should be divided into those same three, like let's say a mile, and then three eighths of a mile, and then a half a mile, and then a quarter of a mile. Um, th those are links to the same energy use that you would do right across the spectrum. And, and that has to do a lot in the Western division with the working cow horses too, uh, where they learn to relax and stay off your reins during the early stages and then relax. I, I can't begin to tell you how impressed I am with the working cow horses of today, where they can run 40 miles an hour down through the arena and slide to a stop 30 feet of skid marks on the floor and then just relax while the guy adjusts his hat or something and just stand there completely relaxed and then spin three or four times like a top and go the other way 40 miles an hour. How can you do that? Well, you can do it, but you have to live in those same stages with that horse. So you have to relax. You have to diaphragmatically breathe when you want that horse to relax. And be assured that the horse wants to relax. It's just your body that will drive them into a non-relaxed state uh, if you're not listening to yourself and meeting their needs with your own diaphragmatic breathing, how much oxygen you have in your blood and how low your adrenaline is, heart rate down, it, it all works beautifully. Uh, we're trying to get more and more of that kind of thing in the uh, online university, which has over 700 lessons now. So there's a lot of stuff in there. But believe me, um, Debbie is using this place now to talk about constant energy output or constant movement because horses were meant to move almost 24 hours a day. And yet our domestication has asked them to just kind of stand in a box stall for three quarters of a day or sometimes 90% of a day, which isn't natural. So they start to do things thumb sucking, I call it, um, like weaving or cribbing or a lot kicking the wall, a lot of different things that cause them to have some activity going. And having a horse keep up that activity throughout the day is really important to them because that's how God made them. And uh, we won't change them in our lifetime, so we might as well learn to live by their standards. And and that was a, actually several of the questions involved weaving and uh, being very tense and and uh, let's see uh, being a little frantic and or uh, general anxiety cribbing and weaving are those things that we can solve and fix and if we can't how can we make them a little better well, the, the thing that the human has to realize is that that horse that's frantic as you're leading it. And we had one of those questions, uh, always up in the air. And but that horse is, is building all of that energy off the person. The person may not realize it, but they've already maybe had some hard bumps from the horse or even a kick from the horse or something. So they get up with their energy and you've got to leave that energy down and you've got to have a smile in the lead rope and then school them when they go wrong. 
school them with the proper equipment so that it's not uh, violent, but it's uncomfortable, and then leave it back again. And you can get the most excitable horse you can imagine to walk with the loose line. And you see the horse racing thing where they haven't taught those people about these things. And it, it, two guys with chains over the gums of the horse's mouth, yanking and holding the horse from exhibiting a lot of energy. Um, bad horsemanship. That's very bad horsemanship. Not to put those people down and they're trying to do their best, but you can learn how to cause the horse to relax by getting your body in sync with the horse the way you want them to be. And uh, we got to do more and more on our online university to get into those areas that are a bit ancillary to what most people worry about. Mm -hmm. And the weaving and cribbing, uh, just in, in my situation, I take a lot of horses that come off the track, they're rehabilitated, ready to go into training, and I restart those horses for a particular rescue, a uh, horse and hound. And so I've had probably six or seven severe stall walkers, weavers. Uh, I've had one or two crippers, not too, too many crippers. But what I found with the stall walkers and the weavers is something that actually I learned about from you in an online university lesson. It's uh, not just a random plug for this. It's called the Tad Coffin Theratry. And it, I don't, it's, I, it's science. And this is not a science brain. Uh, so I don't, under, it's, I call it black magic, but I can put when they come in and they're going to stall walk or they're going to weave. Uh, you had Tad come out and do some demonstrations, but I don't even think he understands how untapped that potential is because I will put that there tree on the weaver and 20 minutes I'll walk away and I come back and the horse is asleep in the stall. I don't understand it. It's science, but it's pretty amazing. And again, I learned that from, from you and, and Nellie Kennedy, one of our awesome and, and listeners. I will certainly listen to that with a great deal of interest. I don't know that much about it either. I don't know. But one of the things I do know is that aside from being uh, invented by God, to have something going on to move almost 24 hours a day, aside from that, they are herd animals and they don't like to be isolated. When they're one horse isolated with four walls, somebody's coming to eat them. When they're isolated from the herd, somebody's coming to eat them. And um, I've had a lot of luck with pygmy goats that don't grow horns that can actually put an eye out or, or hurt the horse unintentionally. But the horse falls in love with a goat Boom, like this. It's unbelievable how quickly they'll fall in love with the goat. And, and then you have another um, yeah, duty on your hands. You have a, another animal. When the horse goes out to work, the goat is calling to the horse constantly. And sometimes the horse is even calling back. But I've had some racehorses that have really benefited from the use of uh, small goats. Um, I had one that that the goat was in a pen in the corner of the stall that was only about three feet high. And the third night the goat jumped out and we were afraid that the horse was gonna kill it because this horse was really bad in the stall, kicking the walls and running circles and everything. And on the fourth morning, third night, it jumped out and got with the horse and the guys found it in the morning with the horse licking it and loving it and standing in a corner, they were, they were in love forever. And uh, so, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at these things and, and use those kinds of things that I've learned. But uh, the, the tree that you're talking about has, has something to do with magnetic force. And it, it really must have uh, unusual qualities about it and certainly worth looking into. Well, I think, too, what you said, um, a lot of times, 
you know, when the horse comes off the racetrack, they've learned these behaviors. And so these behaviors are already in there. And yeah. like you said, it's like thumb sucking, or, I mean, I think of like weaving or cribbing as like smokers, you know, they just can't yeah. ever quite shake it, you know? And so what you had said to me when we were going over these questions was some movement was, was beneficial. And one of these questions, the horse, when every, all everybody, the horses are out in the field, just grazing and hanging out, the horse doesn't weave. But when it comes to feeding time, yeah. when it comes to her friends leaving, you know, they're going to weave. And, and like you said, unfortunately, like what you think is that damage is kind of already done. Yeah. And I, I've been traveling through Germany, watching these things where the horses have lanes that they move to certain areas and they even wear a little collar that has a whatever you call these things that the computer they're called the pat well the uh, here in the u.s we have paddock paradises but over in europe it's really high tech um management where they have a paddock paradise but also the horses wear microchips you can yeah. see this online and they wear microchips in the doors for the hay open at certain yeah. times their grain is available at certain times i'm blanking yeah. on what they're called but yeah it's pretty cool we have to we have to attribute a lot of that to the dairies because they were trying to feed cows by how much milk they produced and the microchip ah. knew that microchip knew the cow and and the history of the cow and would feed it exactly what it needed to produce the maximum amount of milk possible. And that all started there about 25, 30 years ago. And it has really moved into the equine world. And uh, it has to do with movement mostly. I think we lost Jamie. I don't know what happened. <laughs> she just I disappeared. It looks like I took her place on my screen. Yeah, she just disappeared. She'll be back. I don't know what happened. She probably hit a button. She can train horses, but computers, not so good. <laughs> not so good. So uh, we have had a couple of questions here about the movement. Uh, and maybe Debbie could help with these. I don't know if she's still in the room. But uh, we have had, they've asked how they can uh, get on the list for the Sunday sessions. Yeah, um, they, I just put in the on the auditors page glenn hi she pops out from behind the curtain um i put on the auditors page um a link right to jamie's session okay so if anybody if it, i think there was one left so i'm not sure if, if that's now been done or okay. if um if they're looking for the other sessions go to monteroberts.com click there she is okay. oh, sorry oklahoma wind is just crazy right now i don't know well, what happened just... susanna said your microchip shut off um... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i wasn't producing enough milk <laughs> <Really? laughs> we could do better yeah go go to i'm um, sorry i just finished jamie and then i'll get out of here is that um, money so we go to money roberts.com m-o-n-t-y roberts.com and then click on the tab at the top that says the movement it'll tell you all about that on a landing page everything in there and um i should probably say in case it helps people that the vip ticket includes not only the two days and lunches included but it's um unlimited access a vip gift bag with some goodies as we do and um a VIP wine and cheese and Templeton Thompson concert is included. A three month pass on the Monty Roberts online university that we keep talking about here and uh, on demand recordings of the sessions afterward as well. So and then the private sessions on Sunday can be looked at by the by anybody who's holding a ticket. So um, unless, you know, unless somebody's really, really shy and then we'll put you at the back of the farm with Jamie. And then um, we'll have, um, yeah, we'll have, uh, you know, we have just about everybody out there too. So we've mentioned Templeton Thompson um, will be there to, you know, sign CDs. Do they still sell CDs? And then also, but also she's going to have some special music for us. And we've been using her music for the last year. She's her brand new CDs. CD. Yeah. There it is. You got one too. It's so cool. And then we've got private sessions with Monty, Jamie, Mark Bolander, who is the, the mountain trail expert and then we have dr wendy and helena so and glenn and jen just get to smile and have fun and eat able skewers that's my favorite thing to do yeah no responsibility just have fun i love that 
<laughs> and eat. All right. Do you have any more questions? Jamie? Well, I have two more. If okay. Have, well, I'll let you ask them. them. All right. Yeah. So the next one comes from Kelly and it says, how do you get your horse used to being calm going off the property? Aside from going off the property all the time, I guess she goes to a lesson a couple times a week and, and the horse that sometimes gets fairly unhappy. So what are some of the tips for that? Well, if it's possible, one of the tips for that would be to lead the horse with another horse, riding another horse and lead the horse off the property. If they have a horse with them, they tend to relax more. If you then ride them and practice diaphragmatic breathing, practice getting your own adrenaline way down and leave those hands down. Don't pick the hands up and say, oh, you can't jig jag. You can't do that stuff. When I, no, no, go ahead and do it. But then stop and back up and drop the hands again and relax and walk off. And about the fourth time you, you do that particular little exercise, the horse will relax and walk off 90% of the time. Uh, it, it's absolutely incredible. I, I can't begin to tell you how many times I've helped people with this kind of thing and then got on the horse myself and had them just walk down the road like uh, old Dobbin, you know? And it is the insides of the human that tell the horse whether they ought to be excited or not. One of the things that you told me, which I have taken to heart, is the best thing to train a young horse is a good old gelding. And I have the Duke, who's 29 years old. He's been with me for, gosh, 12 plus years. I mean, I got him when he was 17. He came to me perfect. And now he's more perfect. And he does, he just works wonders for these baby horses. And I even have a Clydesdale in training right now who is 18 hands tall. And Duke is a draft cross. He's 16 too. And I always thought he was a really big boy, but he looks like a pony next to this Clydesdale, but he's just at her little security blanket and just kind of he, where he goes, she goes. And they, like you said, they mirror synchronize their adrenaline with you and with other horses. So to have a nice calm gelding mares sometimes have that little mare bubble. So they can climb on Duke. He just doesn't care. Like he just goes, just calm down and we'll get it over with. So that is one of the best tips I think ever. So, you know, like getting a goat, now you got to get another horse. Yeah, More animals. One of the things I want to do to clarify some of the statements I've made is I don't ever want anybody to just relax and get in a position that's dangerous. So you relax and you let the horse do whatever they're going to do, but you don't allow yourself to get in a position where the horse could act against you in a dangerous fashion. Mm -hmm. If you're in that position, then I, you know, I recommend the Dooley halter to be on the ground, feet safe back the horse up a lot until you can then move on to being in the saddle and have a quiet, relaxed horse. Uh, don't ever think that I just say, oh, you should just smile when you're about to get your head kicked off or something. I, I'm not yeah. suggesting that you get yourself in a dangerous position. No, absolutely. Well, uh, the final question we have, and then I'll, uh, let you go. Bryce asked, do you have any tips for getting my thoroughbred to move about calmly when doing groundwork? Apparently he just jumps into a frantic trot. Uh, anything, any tips for Bryce? Well, it's just, that's the same thing I've been saying, you know, let him get frantic and then school the bejesus out of it. Really go that stop back up thing and then long line. Don't hang on and say, oh, now you can't move. No, no. You can move. Go ahead and do it again. And then I'm going to back you again. Um, and then I put the line down again. They will learn that when that line is down and you're relaxed, they will synchronize with that line and with you in a relaxed state. Um, so don't worry so much about what the horse does. And you ask the question because you are worried about it. And I don't blame you for being worried. You you may be in a dangerous position. So maybe you get someone that's really, uh, you know, an advanced horseman to see if you're getting in a dangerous position. But then think about this business of letting the horse do these crazy things just for an instant. And then boom, you school and then leave him alone and then school and leave him alone. 
you might have somebody watch over your shoulder so that you know you're not getting in a dangerous spot. Because I don't want somebody to get kicked and say, well, Monty told me just to smile and stand there. No. Uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. The instant that horse gets you in, in uh, a dangerous place, you school the heck out of the horse. Right. And then with, if you have my dually halter, uh, it's, it's a big help. If you, if you have just a halter, you can do the same thing, but not a tenth as well as the halter that gets smaller when he resists it and bigger and more comfortable when he relaxes and stops the fussing around. You mentioned long lining. That's a fantastic tool as well. And, and it definitely, you know, sometimes people want things to be easy and you have to practice long lining. It's not something that is natural to people that have always lunged a horse in a circle, but get yourself in a round pin. I remember German, German instructor, Denise, who is my instructor. I was terrible with long lining and holding the two lines and getting tangled up. And she said, uh, when you're home, do you turn your horses out? Now I can't do her German accent. She'll kill me. Um, she said, do you turn your horses out? And I said, yes, long line them to the pasture and long yeah. line them back in. And I just had to practice all the time. But once you get good at it, you can take that horse that, you know, like blasts away and do an outside turn an outside turn and let them blast and make them pay for it. And then you've got a horse that if you can long line comfortably say they've never been outside the arena, like one of the other questions, you can have your Duke going out in the front and long line them behind you because then it, you're not putting yourself in harm's way. If you're nervous and attack, you can be right behind them a 30 foot line far enough away from them and create that. I've done a ton of videos on my Facebook page, if you want to see any of these horses, it's flyover farm, Jamie Jennings, certified Monty Roberts instructor. And that is where you can see all these training videos. Monty Roberts university.com is another awesome source. Well, all that stuff is, is so true. And it seems formidable, formidable, but, and too difficult to, to learn. But once you've learned it, you'll find that everything about horsemanship gets easier. It does. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time. Glenn, you're back. Dad's home. What are we Yeah, do? that just means it's time to give away a ticket. So <laughs> right. we've had a dozen people say they're interested in tickets of the auditor group. That's our super fans for the Horse Radio Network. And if and people I've aren't put, an auditor and they want to become one, what do they do? They just go to horseradionetwork.com and click on the auditor banner at the top of the page. But I have put them on a spreadsheet, and I thought we should let Monty pick the winner. So I'm going to sort them. We have... You're going to pick a number between 1 and 12, and okay. that's going to be the winner. Uh, let me sort them quick. All right. They're not in alphabetical order. Go ahead. Between 1 and 12. My favorite number, 1-1. One, one. 11. Kelly 11. Old. Kelly, you are the winner of the free ticket. Congratulations. Good job. I think she's from California, if I remember right. I don't, well, that's convenient. I'm not sure, though. <laughs> so, Kelly, you're the winner, and we'll be in, Debbie will be in touch with you and make sure that you get that all arranged. And we, Jamie and I and Monty are looking forward to seeing you out in California at Flags Up Farm. That'll be oh fun. Oh, my gosh. June can't come soon enough, although we do have a, another listener weekend. And uh, we've oh, yeah. got to go to, Talk about to that land. Real quick. Land Rover, Kentucky, horse trials at the Kentucky Horse Park. It's always exciting. So, And you're doing a meetup, right? Yes, we're going to do a meetup on Friday night at New Vocations. They do a fundraiser for all the adoptable racehorses it's called the Open Barn and Barbecue. We're going to go there. And then Saturday morning, we'll meet at Fence One and walk the cross-country course. It's just awesome to be in Kentucky. There's there's no better place, in my opinion, on earth. So I'm excited to be back. So between Land Rover and the movement, I'm I'm just busting with excitement about, about the future. Very good. Thank you, Monty, for doing this tonight. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me with you. And uh, good luck and keep going. You guys are doing a great job. Smile, and I will keep uh, longlining my pony. So, uh, <laughs> see us drivers, we're used to long lining. See, we, we got long lining yeah. down. <laughs> yeah. Basically, all there's, we do. <laughs> there's a lot going for it. Yep. All right, guys. Thanks a bunch. And Jamie, thank you. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning. All right. Sounds good. Bye, everybody. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks, Debbie. Bye.